I don't know what your policy here is on recording lectures. I mean, I was told I had to record all my lectures, and I said no. It's as simple as that. Uh, but what I do do is I give a podcast for every lecture. So I have my lectures where I tell all my jokes, or my bad stories, or my naughty stories, all the other things that the students get in class. And then there's a 20, 30 minute podcast to anyone who didn't turn up or was sick or anything like that. They were able to listen to it, and that covers the content. But it's a lot drier and something I wouldn't mind having out there in the public forum. My lectures, I don't usually like that having in the public forum, um, which you might find out why. Uh, my, na my name is Akant. It's, it's great to be back. Uh, I did my PhD here some years ago. Uh, although I was never in this building, I was in this horrible prefab that was called, what was it, Commerce 2? It was oh, <laughs> Commerce B. Oh, the Lord. <laughs> There's a reason why I finished my PhD so quickly. Um, uh, and then the year after I left, you got this building. I'm like, damn, what the hell? Uh, so I'm here to talk to you about combining research and teaching. It's quite a complicated, kind of weird uh, talk, but hopefully get through as much as I can and impart as much as I can. I did tell Lynn when she called me about this that I do have a three-hour lecture on this sort of topic. So we're going to run a little over time and we'll be, we'll be done in time for school pickup. But um, uh, I will give a very bridged, condensed version. I've also got some tips on balancing research and teaching together. And if we've got time, I'll go through that uh, as well. Uh, as a quick prefix, though, I, I am primarily a researcher. That's what I do. That's who I am. Uh, what I'm known for internationally is more as a researcher than a teacher. That's why I was hired at the University of Canterbury. Uh, I, ca I came in to try and help with the, the research profile and push my research a bit more, that sort of thing. However, it seems like some people do like my teaching. I'm on a standard 40-40-20 load, which I think most people tend to be. 40% research, 40% teaching, 20% administration. Everyone knows it's usually close to 80-80-80 or something like that. Uh, <laughs> But that is my contractual load, and I have to do a little bit on each. Um, people like to uh, like my teaching, like Luna said, I've won a few awards, um, uh, including I've been voted best lecturer on campus four times in the last four years, which is pretty cool, seeing as how it's voted for by students. It's great when the faculty recognize you, but when the students vote you best lecturer in your college and in the university, it's quite nice. And I don't believe you have that here. You really should have that. It's like the Emmys of teaching awards. It's the one where everyone gets a little more drunk, has a little bit more fun. The formal teaching awards, the faculty ones, are a little later on. But, um, being a good teacher and being a good researcher are not mutually exclusive. Uh, I think this is a myth. This idea that I can only be a good teacher or I can only be a good researcher, I think is crap. I think there's a lot of overlap between the two which make good researchers great teachers and great teachers great researchers. And that's what I really want to talk about. Uh, so balancing the two, uh, for me it comes down to two things, and that's priorities and skills. Uh, first up, priorities uh, in a research-led university system, and some people will disagree about that, but in a research-led university system, research is still the thing that gets promoted. Your heads of departments will lie to you, and they'll say, hey, if you pick up a couple of extra courses, I'll put your name forward for teaching, and for, a, for a teaching award, and that will help you get promoted. Or, you know what, I'll make sure that we put a nice little tick next to your name if you pick up that extra administration. Bullshit. They're lying to you. The only thing that as a young researcher, especially, as a young academic especially, that will get you promoted is good papers because papers are the things that make you marketable. It helps you to move. If someone has five A-star papers, that's going to be very hard to turn them down for a, for a promotion. If someone comes through with some great teaching scores, fantastic. But usually they come back to you and say, but where are the papers? Thanks for picking up all that extra teaching, but where is the research, you know? PBRF is still quite dominant. We don't have a nationally recognized teaching survey in this country, and I think that's wrong. And I've put that to the student union uh, nationally, I've put that to, the, to tech nationally. Why don't we just survey all students across the country and get them to talk about their student experience? And we can measure universities, not just on research, but also on teaching as well. Right now, PBRF is the big one that we talk about on a national scale. There are other rankings, QS and Times Higher, blah, 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 blah. However, the PBRF is still the one nationally that we look at, and that's primarily research. Uh, reputation helps to determine students. We know that we need international students, and international students pay us nice coin, and they look at the rankings. PBRF adds to that. We're able to market it and say, look at our amazing ranking. We managed to do this. It's got nothing to do with teaching, but that's our reputation. So come over and give us all your money. Uh, administrators are going to demand more student interaction, <coughs> the student experience, blah, 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 blah. They're going to demand more of you. And then they're going to demand more that you do more papers as well. So how do we do the two? 
for me, priorities, getting your priorities right, and then having the skills to do the next bit are the things that go hand in hand to make you a good teacher and a good researcher. So being a good teacher, for me, also means you can be a good researcher. And that's what I talk about in the next couple of slides. Um, so being a good teacher takes two things. I think it's very simple to be a good teacher. Number one, know your material. Know what you're talking about. Be able to understand it better than people you are trying to teach. If you don't know as much as the person you're trying to teach, you're in a bit of trouble. Okay? <laughs> so you've got to know your subject's material. And then you have to know how to communicate it to your audience. Now that audience changes. If you're going to communicate it to primary schoolers, then communicate it in a way that primary schoolers understand. You're going to communicate uh, executive education, which is very similar to primary schoolers. I've taught on the executive. Um, <laughs> cut. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't work here anymore, it's all right. Uh, if you're going to teach uh, exec ed, then you need to be able to communicate in a way that executive students want to be taught, okay? So the problem with this is that a lot of academics spend all their time trying to know the material as best as they can. If I know my stuff, then I'm not going to be asked that difficult question, I'm not going to be able to answer, and therefore I'm not going to look like an idiot in front of the class, and that's going to be okay. But it's got to be as much about communication and being able to communicate with various audiences as it is about learning the material. Being a good researcher helps with both of these points. Being a good researcher makes you, in my mind, a better communicator, a better teacher. And here's some reasons why. So being a researcher exposes you to the very forefront of knowledge. You're not just reading the material, but you are analyzing it, you're critiquing it, you're ripping it apart, you're trying to look at what the rationale is behind it. So there's a lot to be said about people who read the material. But with research, you're trying to find the gaps in the knowledge as well. You're trying to tease it apart and see how someone came up with something. Really analyze it and critique it to a point that you know it so, so well that you are going to be able to write a paper that either adds to it or rebuts it or whatever it might be. You're going to add to the knowledge. So your job is to advance that knowledge. And so being a good researcher means you're able to tease that sort of stuff apart. That's going to be useful for you in the classroom because you're going to you know, know the material better than someone who just reads it and says, I know this better than the person I'm teaching them. Being a good teacher means you're standing in front of the people who are going to use that knowledge. You're hopefully going to be teaching people who are going to be applying this work in five, ten years' time. You're talking to people and listening to people's questions that they have right now. If you sat in a room and wrote the whole time, there is no doubt you'll be able to advance knowledge in a theoretical sense with regards to the existing discussions out there in the literature. But if you're not talking to the people who are actually going to use it in the future, are you sure you're even asking the right questions or writing about the right thing? So I'm very much a researcher that likes to make sure that his research is applicable. It is useful to people out there as well. So I have this interface where I can talk to students, I can work with students, and as a result, I can listen to the sort of queries and concerns they have and try to find solutions to that in my research as well as my teaching. Uh, and research involves criticality, like I said. So if you can critically analyze what's going on in a paper, the same skills, the same knowledge can be used when you critically an analyze your class. You can tease it apart. You can find out what works, what doesn't work, why it works, that sort of thing, rather than let's see what I can do differently. I am racing through this for a good reason, but I'll try to answer any questions. Uh, so a good teacher is able to adapt his or her communication to the target audience. I work with a lot of young researchers who send me a great paper that they've written. I've been working on this for three years. I've been working on this for so long through my PhD. I really like to publish it. And I'll say, fantastic, where are you going to publish it? Oh, I haven't really decided yet. Well, that's a terrible thing. You decide where you're going to publish it first, and then you write for that audience. Teachers know that. When a teacher comes into a new situation, they want to know who they're talking to, because you can frame your responses, your questions, your uh, approach differently for that audience. They make fantastic writers. Good teachers make fantastic writers because they analyze the audience before they even start communicating to them. The worst teachers are the ones that don't communicate in a manner that an audience understands, whether it's monotone or whatever it might be. Or, in saying that, I had one economics professor in my undergrad who was completely monotone, but he was deadpan. He was hilarious. And he had a strong southern accent. And I think his running joke was, if y'all get bored, with what I'm saying, just count how many times I say y'all. <laughs> and that was his whole lecture. It was just him saying y'all. Uh, and, and so that kept, kept saying it. You can be dead pan and hilarious. But anyway, um, so a good teacher is able to communicate orally and in a written form. Good communicators are able to switch it up and communicate in different ways. The best research is the one that communicates well, 
but it's also advancing knowledge. The best communicators, the best teachers, the ones that communicate well, but also advance your knowledge. And they're similar skills. The problem is we end up focusing so much on one thing and focusing so much on other things, depending on what our priorities are or what our current skill sets are. Okay? Now, those priorities could be dictated down to you from your head of department or whomever, or <coughs> your head of learning and teaching. Um, they will decide things for you because that's what you're paid to do. But your career is the one at stake. Your career is yours to take hold of. Your career is the one that you want to advance. So you will need to know, I could do all this, but I need to be able to keep up with this. Okay? Bad research will not co be compensated for by excellent teaching. And, excellent, and bad teaching is not going to be compensated for by uh, excellent research. There's got to be a balance between the two. So, um, a good researcher is able to break down an argument, present knowledge logically and convincingly. I would say good teachers are able to do this as well. When you read an article, it's meant to flow from section to section. It's meant to show a journey as you go. Teachers are able to do a similar thing. If you're a good researcher, you should be able to show the same sort of thing to your audience. If you're a good teacher, you should be able to communicate that in a journal article. Again, not mutually exclusive. So I want to uh, talk a little bit, I'll do this, uh, these four little ways of combining research into your teaching, uh, uh, and then I'll talk about some, some sort of tips for balancing the two in the last couple of minutes I have. Uh, so this teacher-led approach, which is, which is a standard approach, where you would provide some readings from a textbook or a journal article, and then you talk about the concept in class. Pretty standard, pretty basic, and it's very little in the way of combining research into your teaching. Uh, the inside knowledge approach is something that I use a lot of in my third year and my postgraduate classes, where I present a seminal piece from uh, the literature. Here is the great and the good talking about this theory. And I'll present my work that I've published in a similar theory or concept. And I'll say, read, 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 understand the concept, very basic, but let me tell you how I actually wrote this paper. Because the paper that you read is linear. <coughs> I started here, I came up with this research question, here's my blah, blah, blah. blah. In reality, research is kind of all like this. And students get excited about hearing those inside stories. Tom is fantastic when it comes to war stories. If you want to hear some war stories about industry, come to one of his classes. He tells you about all the inside knowledge that he would come without revealing any sensitive material, of course. Uh, <laughs> but he'll tell you about all the backstories, the stuff that never gets shown because he was there, he was living it. The same way with your research. That's the stuff that gets students excited about research. Not that you're talking about research, but you're talking about how it developed, how it grew. So when I present my work, I say, well, this is how it is, but uh, when I present it to a public forum, but you guys get to hear the inside story. Um, the student-led uh, led approach or the seminar style works really well for smaller groups uh, where you might have you know, 30, 40 people in a class. I don't know how many universities still have that, but. Fantastic for that sort of thing, where you provide a key set of themes and some introductory material and let the students lead the discussion. Let them come up with different papers. Let them come up with other research angles. Uh, uh, my supervisor was uh, Brett Martin, who's now in Queensland, and, and I used to be impressed that he could lead a three-hour class without saying a damn thing. He used to stand there and say, here's the readings, what do you guys think? And for three hours, we would yell at each other. Okay? <laughs> And then he walk away with a nice big paycheck. I'm like, what the hell? I want to do that. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay? Student-led research integration into teaching because the students are excited, understand the research, and they can focus on how they develop the arguments themselves, and you become a facilitator of their learning. Uh, the, the last one is a student-centered approach. Now, I don't like this whole move to student-centered learning. I think students need to be told what they need to know at times as well, rather than just listening to students. I'm getting the evils already. Um, but it allows the students to determine concepts and themes that they want to know more about, and you facilitate their knowledge. So I'm doing this in my master's program at the moment, where I'll say, you know what? You tell me what you think is important to you, and I'll mix it up with what I think is important as well, and we will develop the knowledge together. We will co-create this knowledge. We will co-create an environment where research and teaching becomes joined together. Now, that means they have to go out and research. Already you're winning because they're out researching. You're developing a culture of research. They come back after doing a little bit of research, whether it's in the academic literature or in the newspaper or whatever it might be, and then they debate it. They discuss it. I get more discussion out of my master students online while they're researching this stuff than I do in class. Because in class, it's kind of a weird thing to want to speak up in front of people and, impromptu sort of setting. Online, they can think about it. They can say, I've just seen this. 
What do you guys think? Or I've just experienced this, what do you think? So in class, there's a lot of one-to-many sort of approach. Offline, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning happening. Very student-centered, let them drive it. The lecturer becomes a navigator, navigator of the student's knowledge rather than anything else. So the way I kind of describe it with my students is that you are going to be rowing this boat. You will come to me with some ideas. And I'll say, yeah, that's a kind of a good idea. Let's go in that direction. And they disappear for a couple of weeks. And then they'll come back to me and say, I've done a bunch of rowing and hard work down that. You know, like, yeah, maybe it was kind of crap. Let's go that way now. Okay? And then they go that way. So my, my poor research students get kind of directed all over the place until they come to an area where they are comfortable. And I think that there's something that we can advance knowledge with. But they have to do the hard work. You become a navigator and a director rather than someone who tells them what's right or wrong. Okay? So that's kind of where I'm going to stop with regards to the combining research into teaching. But I want to, don't want to leave here without giving some, some ideas. I have these 10 commandments of research and teaching. Uh, and, and, and they work for me. Now, might not be exclusive, might not cover everything, but hopefully there's something in here that will help you. And number one, thou shalt read and read often. Um, the most important point in this is that don't make time for reading. You make time for everything else. You put aside time to read, whether it's reading pedagogy, reading literature, whatever it might be. Once a week, at least, you set aside a day to read. And everyone's going, holy shit, how do you find a day to read? How do you find a day not to read? If you're not engaged with the current literature, if you're not up with the play of the current pedagogy, how are you ever going to advance yourself? Okay? You are looking at your careers. You are looking at your own development. That means putting the effort in. That means putting aside a little bit of time. I usually do it out of the office. Stick everything on my iPad, disappear to the beach, and I'll read for the day. Okay? Now, granted, there are times where I might skip a week or two, but there'll be other times where all I do that week is reading. I will catch up. Make time to read. Uh, shall not be too proud to ask for help. One of the great things about <coughs> academia is that the egos are massive. I love egos. I love looking at professors ponce around thinking how amazing they are and how hard it is for people to ask for help. It is okay to ask for help. Asking for help does not mean you are weak. It means you want to advance your knowledge. And so ask for help with your teaching. Get someone to sit in your class. Ask for help with your research. Send them a manuscript. Ask them to review it. And expect them to tell you what's wrong with it. If you go, here you go, I'd love to get your feedback and it comes back not glowing, don't be mad. You ask them for your damn feedback. It's okay. <laughs> Um, number three, <coughs> thou shalt not put all your eggs in one basket. Okay, this goes for research and teaching. Make sure you have a few papers on the go. Make sure you have a couple, I, my general rule is to have nine papers going at any one time. Nine separate projects. Three in the early stages. Three collecting data, three writing up for submission. Now I work on a policy of about 30% of the stuff I write gets accepted, 70% gets rejected. That means, hopefully, I'll have one or two papers accepted per year. If I was only working on one project, one paper a year, that's one paper every three, four years. That's not good enough for the PBRF. Sure isn't good enough for your HOD. Okay? So have lots of projects going. When it comes to teaching, the same thing. I have a good colleague uh, who is a world-class teacher, and he teaches a large first-year management class. Amazing guy, puts a lot of effort in. Guess what? It's very difficult for him to take sabbatical. Because no one wants to teach a 1,000 students, number one, and no one can do the job as good as him. So he's locked into this situation. Balance your teaching. Juggle a couple of things. Something at the postgrad level, something at the undergrad level, something external in the community. Okay? Do lots of different things. It looks great on the CV, but also makes you a little bit more varied. You can juggle things around. Um, thou shalt celebrate other successes and mourn their setbacks with honesty and integrity. I don't see this enough in university. When someone succeeds, when someone wins, then you celebrate with them. You do it honestly. You say how great they are. You don't give some sort of backhanded compliment, which we know we're really good at. Um, you celebrate with them. Teaching awards, research publications, whatever it might be, and then they will do it back. It builds a strong culture in your department. Uh, get over rejection and keep trying. I take rejection badly. I hate rejection. Okay? It's one of the reasons why I got married so young. I was sick of being rejected. As soon as someone, <laughs> said, as soon as someone said yes, I'm like, I'm locking onto this one. All right? You laugh. It's true. <laughs> um, okay. um, 
Again, same for, uh, same for research, same for teaching. Uh, how many people love anonymous student reviews? Mm. <laughs> Uh, I, I used to teach here in the research methods class and I used to teach with a lovely young lady who's still here and, and very young, vibrant, good looking young lady and she used to get all these filthy things said in her reviews and she used to complain about how they're saying such horrible things about her and sexualized things about her. So I've never had one. <laughs> just, like, just, just give me one, that's all I want. Okay? Just, you know, I want to rub your head or something like that. Anyway, my first semester teaching at Canterbury uh, one of the questions we have is, is there anything you want to change about this course to make it better? And someone wrote, brave as they are, his ethnicity. <laughs> like, oh, that's the, and I stood up and clapped. My head of department was next door to me and said, what's going on? I said, dude, read this one. <laughs> that's how you know you've made it to Christchurch. Um, <laughs> so he was, he was obviously upset about this. Now, I, I could not dwell on this. I can't stop and think, oh God, what a horrible place I'm in. You get over it and you move on, okay? The same way you get over your rejections from journals and you move on, okay? You can bitch and complain about it for a few days, perfectly fine. But if that kills your career, it's your career. Nobody else's, okay? Uh, thou shalt surround yourself with people who encourage and empower you and not isolate yourself. Find good people. They exist, trust me. They're hard to find sometimes, but they exist and surround yourself with them. One of the best things I did, I think, <coughs> genius, I think it was just complete fluke more than anything, is when I was a newly uh, graduated PhD student, I made sure I kept in touch with other people in my PhD cohort internationally, not just here. But I had about six, seven uh, other PhD students in a similar situation to me who we emailed regularly. We caught up. We talked about research. We reviewed one another's work. Okay? We kept ourselves strong and encouraged one another. We had a physical group as well that I would meet at when I was working at the University of Bath every week. One hour, the four or five of us would get together and we would talk research. Nothing else, just research, okay? It wasn't, we weren't in the same disciplines, but we were just bonding with each other, struggling together and hopefully working together. Ooh, I'm running out of time, okay. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, thou shalt stay humble. Now, I think arrogance has its place. Um, uh, a lot of people are looking at that and thinking, hey, can't not that, you know, what the hell. Um, in all honesty, being humble goes a long way, okay? It makes for a stronger culture. Arrogance has its place. It can be a show, it can be a performance, but in your core, you should be able to be honest and have integrity and be humble about your work and your colleagues. Uh, you should review. That's review other people's classes and review for journals. If you can see mistakes in other people's work, in their writing, or in their teaching, guess what? You're going to be able to apply that in your same way. I have not sit through, sat through four or five hours of talks in a long time. So this has been great, because I'm not that mad at people who use their iPads in my class anymore, because I know I've been checking work while I've been here. My apologies to our wonderful speakers, you're not that interesting. No. Uh, but we, we get this, and I know we get all upset because people are on their phones or on their iPads, you know, and stuff like that. But it's okay, because that's how we are, all right? You build an empathy for the other side as well. You review for, lect uh, for uh, journals, review for people's classes. It teaches you a lot. Uh, meet often. Now, this isn't even to talk research or anything. Meet often, chat, catch up. It is a lonely existence, like I say, but it's good to catch up. Now, uh, those of you who know anything about New Zealand history will know that we had an earthquake a few years ago. We were in open plan setting for about two years or so. We were, I've been in six offices in three years. It's been fantastic, okay? Finally got my office, which is good. But when it's an open plan setting, and I love my colleagues, they're fantastic. I just don't want to sit next to them. Um, 17, 18 people to a room, probably about the same size as this room, every single day, a lot of people work from home, okay? It kills a culture. As a group, even if you don't like the person, make sure you catch up in social settings. You find some way that you can bond, okay? I'm a big proponent of social media. Uh, I spend a lot of time on social media, so I don't think physical connections are necessary. I think you can have an emotional connection with someone you've never met, as long as you are connecting with someone and not isolating yourself. Uh, me regularly chat about work. Uh, and finally, and I think most importantly, make sure you have fun. <laughs> if you are not having fun, you will go bald at a young age. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I went bald the year I got married. <laughs> I know correlation doesn't equal causality, but you know what. Uh, 
You will rip your hair out if you have hair. You will hurt yourself if you don't have hair. You will hate your existence if you are not having fun. So you can dwell on the negativity in your job, or you can think about, well, what are the awesome things we do? We get to advance knowledge. We get to generate knowledge for someone who is going to lead this country in the future. Uh, someone asked me recently, what do you want to be when you were a kid? What did you want to grow up? And old people say farm and you know, policeman, whatever. I always, as far as I can remember, always wanted to be a shepherd. I don't know why. I always wanted to be a shepherd. Um, and just the idea of being surrounded by mindless animals uh, and being able to, to think all day was fascinated me. Just have spending the time to read and think. And someone said, so that's why I became a lecturer. I'm like, no, you can't, can't say that. But I wanted to think. I wanted to read. Now, some idiot out there is paying me to think, read, write, and talk. How does that get any better? Okay? You have the flexibility and the uh, ability to do an amazing thing in this society. And if we're not having fun with it, then something is wrong. So make sure you have fun. That's all I have. So I would be willing, sorry, three minutes up. Willing to take any questions, comments, queries. Yes, other things. No, sweet. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Go on, Andrew. Um, I've made it why can't you say <laughs> I, I recently was fortunate enough to get some funding to do a bit of a round the world uh, lecturing tour, and I took my wife and kids with me because there's no way I could do this without my wife and kids. And so many people ran up to my wife and, uh, to just say, We wanted to see if you were real. Because there is no way we believed that someone could put up with him all the time. We barely put up with him for three days at a conference. How is this possible? Okay, yeah, my wife is a saint. And, I appreciate her every day. <laughs> but what does she say in response to that? She, she questions. <laughs> no, no. Uh, no. Uh, she, she, I mean, those of you who are on um, social media will know that I went viral recently for some stupid things I wrote about. I wrote a whole bunch of Valentine's cards to my wife, which were honest Valentine's cards. And things like, you know, um, we're together forever because of the kids. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're stronger together financially. Um, oh, the, the hassle of putting up with you is less than the hassle of dating again. These sorts of things. Anyway, so I posted this on Facebook and it went viral. And people are like, what a jerk, what an ass. My wife has as weird a sense of humour as I do. So we get on very well together. <laughs> and she plays the role of the dutiful wife pretty well and just puts up with me. <laughs> yes, Lisa. Okay, um, so uh, you're a associate professor now. Correct. You're well established in your... Uh, Career. Thank you. If you go back to when you were a PhD student, early teacher, yep. how long, what was the process and how long did it take for you to kind of reconcile between you know, becoming a good researcher and becoming a good teacher? Sure. Because I know you tell a really coherent story now, but I suspect it was um, that smooth. I know there are people in this room who are like this, but I struggle to say no. I have a very hard time telling people, no, I cannot do this, because that makes me look bad, I think. I think I cannot be the good citizen in my organization who's paying me if I don't say yes to everything. Now, that kills your career, both teaching and research. I was very lucky that I had a professor who was very good at saying no for me. He would basically come up to me and say, hey, you know that thing that that person said you should do? Yeah, you're not doing that anymore. I told them no. Okay? So I was very lucky that way. Uh, and like it's, this is part of this wider lecture that I do on, uh, I'm giving this, if you're in marketing, I'm giving a talk on advancing your uh, early academic career in Brisbane later this year. Um, but finding those heroes who will champion you is fundamentally important. Now, sometimes what that means is finding a professor whom you are valuable to because you've got data or you've got research skills. And they will say, no, I don't want you teaching that extra thing. I want you working with me to get this published because I think it'd be good. Whatever gets them excited about you protecting you works. So that's one part of it. How you negotiate it, you will have troughs and you will have peaks and all sorts in your career where you are doing heaps of teaching, heaps of research, heaps of teaching, whatever it might be because it's impossible to do both 100% of the time. You will find very quickly, usually through trial and error and pain and heartache, how the balance works. So in my early two, three years, I was lucky that at the University of Bath, they gave you a lot of teaching relief if you're three years out of your PhD to focus on research, to get your research career going because they valued research. I believe that's the opposite in some places. Oh, you're a new person and we're paying you? You can double your teaching load, all right? That kills your research. 
It really does. You find time for research. Now, I know other people who have gone, in spite of doing 500 contact hours a year, I'm going to see if I can push out one A journal a year. And then I'll make the case that if I was given some relief, I might be able to push out two or three of those. But right now, I am burning myself out. Remember, as much as I hate HODs love us and they want us to be good, it is still your career. You need to take care of yourself. It's very difficult to do when you're a young researcher trying to make an impression, a young academic trying to make an impression, and trying to look like the good person. But in the long run, it really does help. I have two and a half hours more on that I could talk about. <laughs> So, I was curious about your four modes of teaching. Yes. Earlier on, you, you essentially positioned the teacher as the expert in the room. Um, and you sort of Except for the last one, yeah. Yeah, but, Karen, yeah. You moderated that. Yeah. So I'm curious about the, the concept of positioning yourself as a teacher as, as the non-expert in the room. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to a supervision sort of situation, especially when you're supervising PhDs, then you become an expert on how to complete research, but not necessarily the context or the content. Mm -hmm. So my PhD student knows a lot more about his topic right now than I do, because he has lived it for the last two and a half years. But I know how it probably can get published. I know how we can squeeze that out into a couple of good um, um, publications. I also know how he could pass without, with as little heartache as possible. Hopefully no. We'll see in a few months' time. Um, but that way, I become less of an expert with regards to the content, more of an expert on facilitating the development of his knowledge. Now, good teachers are still able to develop knowledge without knowing the stuff, because you know pedagogy. You know how to get the most out of people. Um, so this whole student-centered approach where you must do everything the student wants, I, I think is dangerous. I, I yell at my students. I swear at them. I, I walk out of class if they haven't been working hard enough because that might be what they need. Not what they want, but it might be what they need. Uh, a student recently emailed me and said, I haven't turned up to the last four weeks of classes. Can I meet with you on Thursday and catch up? And my reply was, no. <laughs> Send. Okay? I'm sure someone will get upset by that. Probably the student. Who cares? All right? You need them to learn what is important for the whole class, for you, and for them. And sometimes that means being the bad guy. <coughs> but that, Tangent for what you're saying. Does that kind of help explain that? I believe there is talk of going to a social bridge and having a lunch there and be more than happy to chat casually off the record when your dean's not here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank you. Thank you all for